Associate Professor Kenneth Sikaris. He's a Director of Chemical Pathology at Melbourne Pathology Australia and Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology in Melbourne University. Prof Sikaris has been the Chair of the RCPA QAP Chemistry and Key Incident Programs and is an examiner for the AACB and RCPA Faculty of Science. He has been Chair of the IFCC Committee on Analytical Quality and a member of the IFCC Committee on Reference Intervals and Decision Limits. So I know in part one of his uh, committees, he's also been uh, on tumor markers. So very excited to have him here today uh, to share his uh, expertise. So Thank welcome, you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, it's a particularly challenging area, tumor markers. So um, and I've been involved in various stages, particularly with PSA testing for um, many years. So. I've got about 10 cases sprinkled around to just demonstrate the issues in tumour marker reporting. So in Australia, the common cancers in uh, women are breast, lung, colorectal, um, unknown primaries and pancreatic. And in men, prostate replaces breast, but it's pretty much the same sequence. So they're the cancers we're mainly interested in. Um, now, just some definitions. A tumour is a non-inflammatory abnormal growth arising from existing tissue but growing independently of normal rate and serving no physiological function. Now a mark is some quality or feature. So a marker is something that if a quality or feature of a tumour. So what are the qualities and features of tumours? Because that's what our tumour markers should be finding. So we have lots of things that change with cancer in the laboratory, calcium, sodium, creatinine, alkaline. So you could say they were tumour markers. They're markers of the presence of a tumour, but they're not the tumour markers we normally talk about. So what are the tumour properties that we want the markers to reflect? Well, tumours have mutations and we can actually, there are some tests we can do to look for those mutations. So papillomavirus antibodies or the herb, herb or HER2 mutations or P53 gene antibodies. So, um, or markers of apoptosis. So um, cells survive longer when they're cancer cells. And you, there are tests that look at that survival capacity. There are proliferation. So the proliferating cell uses up substrate. And one of the ones that it uses is cholesterol to grow the membranes and so on. So often have low cholesterols in advanced cancer. Um, invasion. So um, when tumours invade bone or the gut and cause bleeding and fecal got blood, that's also a marker of a tumour. Um, Advanced cancer, particularly metastatic cancer, is often associated with inflammation because of the necrosis and the invasion. And so CRP is often elevated in metastatic disease, albumin is lower, um, ceruloplasmin is higher and copper is higher in cancer because it's an acute phase reactant and increases in inflammation. Um, and necrosis, when cells die, they release their structural elements like the cytokeratin. So all of these are markers. But again, we haven't touched on the tumour markers we usually use in the laboratory. But these are all, they are markers, but they're not the markers that we're after. So if we focus more clinically, what are the markers that we're interested in? Well, clinically, the cancers that present earliest are the tiny endocrine cancers which produce hormones and produce symptoms and signs in it when the tumour is often um, microscopic. And so um, now these are tumour markers, but they're also normal hormones. So they're, again, they're not what we commonly consider tumour markers. So what is an ideal tumour marker? An ideal tumour marker is one that's present when there is a cancer. So there's high sensitivity and it's absent when there's no cancer. So you can't really say that, you know, hormones are absent or sodium's absent if there's no cancer. So ideally, that it should be present with a cancer and not present where there's no cancer. It should be specific for the organ. So the, the presence of that tells you exactly which tissue the cancer is arising from. And PSA 
is organ specific and thyroglobulin is organ specific but it's not specific for cancer because PSA can be elevated in prostatitis and thyroglobulin can be elevated in thyroiditis. It should correlate with the mass and stage and therefore the prognosis and it should change with therapy. So this is a really important issue in a tumour market. We, we want it to be able to tell us about the cancer and whether and particularly when we're going to try to cure that cancer. So these are all the characteristics of the ideal tumour marker. Now there's been several candidates over the years. Um, ben Jones found the um, light chains in the urine by the chemical changes in heating and so on. Um, enzymes were found as tumour markers and then with radioimmunoassay we started to find these onco-fetal antigens which we'll discuss. Then monoclonal antibodies came around and we started discovering these um, other antigens of, of tumours. More recently, there are genetic markers and informatics markers, but um, I won't be talking to those too much. So the common tumour markers that we use in that sort of ideal sense, reflecting tumour burden and monitoring disease and detecting disease, are PSA, alpha feta protein, CEA, CA199, CA125 and 15.3. And here I've given the, the typical yearly volume in our lab many years ago, but the volumes wouldn't have changed that much. So by far the most common is PSA, after that CEA, CA125, and then the others are. Um, and they also vary by gender, which ones you're using. And that's logical because, you know, different cancers for effect. I'll come back to that. So how do we use those tumour markers? There's basically three main areas to screen and find disease. Now there's, I've put a difference there between screening, case finding and diagnosis. There's a difference between those things, a subtle but important difference. Prognosis, so the level reflects the likely outcome of the patient and monitoring. So there, the, now I'll go through, so we'll be going through all of these uses with case studies and, and so on, but let's think about, this is a, you know, how a tumour marker might be used. And this is adapted from an article by Gerard Siest. So here's the tumour marker and its normal levels and people usually stay within the tram tracks, the normal levels, um, and we know they don't have a tumour. But what happens if somebody drifts outside the normal range. So that's how we use, that's the screening phase. So we're, we're looking for people who, people who are drifting outside the reference interval. And in particular, something that I'm very interested in is if you're consistently above the average for the population, the median value for the population, then your likelihood of having an early cancer is much higher. Once you're outside the reference interval, clearly you've got a higher risk. So that's the first stage, screening. And there might be a level that you reach which says, well, it's so high compared to normal, you, you must have a disease. So di diagnostic levels, if you like. Now, diagnosis always depends on tissue histology. Biochemistry rarely diagnose a tumour. You usually need histology to confirm that diagnosis. So then you might treat that cancer. And now the level that it reached and its response to treatment all tell you about prognosis. And in particular, if you can treat so that the tumor marker returns to the reference interval, that's a very good sign of, of response to treatment. Some say 50% improvement, some say, you know, returning to the reference interval. But then, you know, you have to keep monitoring because we've got the problem of recurrence. So here are the, those four sort of areas of where, how you might use a tumour marker and how you how the levels of them might be important. What about screening? Now, the ideal screening test, this is different to the ideal tumour marker, the ideal screening test is screening for a disease where there's a significant community burden. You know, to screen for a very rare disease is not as important as screening for a very common disease. Um, it should be a treatable condition. There's no point screening for a condition that's incurable. Screening for, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, it's sort of like, well, why would you do that? 
um, high specificity. So we want very few false positives in the screening test because false positives cause concern follow-up investigations. And now specificity depends on both the reference interval, the 95% specific reference interval or 99% specific reference interval, as well as the prevalence of non you know, dis other diseases that, that change the tumour marker. You also want high sensitivity. So you want this tumour marker to change quickly as soon as there's any disease present. And lastly, it should be convenient and easy to use and cheap and so on. Now, that's a tall order. And, and I'm going to tell you now why screening virtually never works, as we hope. So let's consider uh, I've invented a new tumour marker, which is 99% specific and 99% sensitive. And I'm going to use it for a cancer which has a community prevalence of one in a hundred, like a very high prevalence of cancer. So this should be really good. Almost perfect tumor marker with a high prevalence cancer. Let's apply it. So here is we've got 10,000 people. We know the prevalence is 1%. So there's 100 people with cancer. 99% sensitivity means we'll get positivity in disease, 99% means 99 true positives and only one false negative. We've only missed out on diagnosing one patient. Um, hopefully they're not a lawyer because I might lose all the money I make out of the tumour marker. But <laughs> anyway, but let's say now 9,900 of those 10,000 people are healthy and 99% specificity or negativity in health means that 9,801 are true negatives and 99 are false positives. So that's very good in terms of the negative predictive value. When you get a negative, you're almost certain to be healthy. But what about the positive predictive value? Because we've got equal numbers of true positives and false positives, even in this almost ideal scenario. So really, when people say, you know, the positive predictive value of this test is 50%, that's amazingly good. In screening programs in Australia for screening for cervical cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, most of them have got a positive predictive value of 30 to 40%. It's never more than 50%. 30 to 40% is probably as close to 50% as we'll ever get. So, and 30 to 40% means that we've got almost twice as many false positives as true positives. And we have to accept that in screening. We have to accept that's what happens with screening. Now, Unfortunately, all that screening leads to false positives and people think you're wasting money. And there's been lots of study. Here's a recent one from Saudi Arabia where um, the, um, you know, the, they're estimating that there's wasting $3 million a year from screening and so on. I want to look at that in, Australia, in the Australian setting. So in, with PSA testing, over the last 25 years in Australia, PSA testing was rising very rapidly up to about 2010. And then the number of PSA tests hasn't really changed in the last 10 years in Australia. And uh, in, in 2001, we introduced a different uh, category for mon uh, screening versus monitoring. You can see that whilst most of the initial tests were for, uh, for screening, most of the recent tests are for monitoring. Now, whilst I say things haven't changed in the last 10 years, one thing has changed, which is the population of Australia. So when you look at the per capita testing rate for PSA, it's actually been falling over the last 10 years. So when people say hey, all this all this increased testing of PSA, it's been decreasing in Australia. Um, and here's just the proportional thing of each year. So while 60% of the testing in 2002 was for screening, now it's less than half of the testing is done for screening. And that also makes sense because once you find the disease from screening, there's less to find later on. And you're mainly monitoring the patients that you've already found. 
Okay, what about the other tumour markers, alpha feeder protein CA, and you know, as are they changing with time? Now we've got only one category when we're monitoring this in in the Australian rebate system. So, yes, that no, those other tests, whether you're doing one of those tests or uh, more than one of those tests, it's been rising steadily over the last 25 years, but it is plateauing. And when you allow for the um, per capita rate, it's virtually plateaued since 2010. So there's not an exponential increase in tumour marker testing in Australia. Um, the number of patients that are having more than one tumour marker has been increasing. So now it's about a third of patients are having two, one or more tests per episode rather than uh, one test. So that's been changing. Now, you might think that that's a marker of increasing screening, like you're doing lots of tumour markers, but I hope to show you that that's a logical thing with a lot of cancer monitoring to measure more than one tumour marker. Okay, I mentioned before the tumour markers tend to be gender specific, so PSA is done in men. Um, CA125 and CA153 is mainly in women because that's breast and ovary. And so that's also evidence that this is not being abused. We're not just ordering any test on anybody. We're testing people for the cancers they're likely to have. Um, some of the tumour markers are gender specific, like I said, PSA. Um, other markers like for testicular cancer, HCG and alpha feta protein, the same for, you know, can be used in ovarian cancer as well. So um, not all of the markers are gender specific. Anyway, we'll be going through some of those things. So, so the important thing with screening, screening is everyone, like everyone over the age of 50 gets the test, regardless of symptoms. Well, it's offered to everyone. You can't force everyone to have it. They, they still, and generally about only 60% of people choose to have the test when it's offered. So, um, so that's everyone. But case finding is when you've got a risk factor either a clinical risk factor, like you've got symptoms, or a family risk factor or a sign like hepatitis. Um, these are all things that increase the prevalence of disease and make the diagnostic testing far more effective. So the positive predictive value will improve if you apply it to a high risk population. That's called case finding, not screening. Now, how do we improve specificity? Um, well, we can improve its specificity by changing our reference interval from 95% reference interval to 99% reference interval, like I did with my ideal marker. Um, you can, but you'd lose specificity when those markers are elevated in benign disease. And virtually all tumor markers can be elevated in benign disease. We'll discuss that soon. You know, unlike the early, well, this is when PSA was first discovered by Pepsidera and Wang in 1980. So they said, well, you know, normal people rarely elevated and whether you've got prostatitis or different levels of prostate cancer, you get the increases in PSA. So they've said it's prostate specific because it's elevated in benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's not cancer specific, it's prostate specific. And so therefore benign diseases of the prostate can increase PSA. Now here's our first case. I've called it case zero because he doesn't actually have cancer. He's an 87 year old man. He's been having PSA testing and his PSA suddenly went from four to 139 in one year. Now you might think, that's an aggressive cancer. Cancers never do that. Cancers rise gradually over months or years. And so this is not cancer. And so our comment for that would be that total PSA levels between 40 to 150 are most commonly associated with neoplasia, but also may be due to urinary tract infection or prostatitis. And you can see this patient had a CRP, which is elevated, which it confirms that it's probably likely to be an infection of the urinary tract or the prostate. And the follow-up recommended is urological follow-up to manage his likely prostatitis, because that can be a very serious disease. Not, I could easily kill an 87-year-old man too. 
Now, just something here that you might have noticed, the PSA reference interval I'm using for an 87-year-old man is up to nine. So the, when he had 6.8 in 2016, we didn't flag it as a high. So what is the reference interval? This is the issue of specificity in the reference interval. Back then, we were using the architect method, and the architect method said the reference interval for men aged 40 to 79 is below four. Well, there's a problem. He's over the age of 70. But he did. they did say when in men 70 to 79, the reference interval is up to 7.3. So in the kid insert for, for Abbott, it does say that there is an age-related rise in PSA, even though they're sort of bound by FDA requirements of precedent devices to keep coding this stupid four from 25 years ago. Um, if you ask Abbott, do you have any information on the reference intervals for the different age groups? Then they can provide them. They rise with age, but only up. That's the same population as the kid insert, and it's up to 5.4 in 70 to 79 year olds. But you know, what about that 80 year old or a 90 year old? Now we did some reference interval studies in Australia using the Abbott method, and we found that the reference interval rises exponentially with age, and that's why we're using nine, because we determined that it was 0.25 to nine in men of the age of 80. And when you compare our cutoffs with the Abbott cutoffs, well, they're correct up to about age 70, and then they're different. Now, one thing I want to point out is it's not just the upper limit that's rising, it's the mid value. And the mid value is very important in terms of prediction of risk. And in all of the kid inserts, they tend to provide the median value because people understand that it's an important value to, to have. So the median PSA in a young man is 0.6, whereas the median level in an older man is something like 1. Now, in the COBAS kid insert, they had an early study of 244 men, of, and then they did another study of, uh, of 395 men, 50 to age 94. So they've got these cutoffs, but they're not as granular as the ones that we had we developed for our own lab. Um, now, one thing also I wanted to point out, in the kit inserts, they say expected values. Expected values are not reference intervals. These are the expected values in health, and expected values can also be the expected values in disease. And so in the kit inserts, they tell you that the expected values in benign disease are up to about 70 or 80. So, uh, whereas the expected values in malignancy could be in the thousands. Now, this is, uh, I'll, I'll show you a few of these. Um, these are just one sample that was sent to Australian laboratories and with PSA level of around 60 and what the results were for different platforms. Um, most results are similar. They average around, let's say, 60 to 70. If a patient's 60 to 70, they're going to be 60 to 70 on another platform. But there are subtle differences. Abbott, for this particular sample, was slightly lower than Roche, and Siemens was somewhere in between. And just a big caution regarding Beckman. Beckman has two calibrations available. The WHO calibration, which gives higher results than the Hybritech calibration. And in my mind, I'm not sure they've got them exactly right. So this just means caution when you're moving between methods, because the methods can differ for any particular sample. Okay, so case, the first case, um, this is a man, 2001, this is 20 years ago. Uh, he was 76 year old, he had a PSA level of 1.5, so what do we say? Well, it's normal. No, no, it's, it's above the median. So it's above average. So guess what? His risk of prostate cancer is above average. Um, so we say in Australia, and I'll come to our guidelines, when you're above average, you should repeat in a couple of years. The reason why we do that is when we look at this study by uh, Vickers and uh, Scardino, if the PSA is above the median value, above 1.1, then um, 
your risk of dying starts to increase. If your PSA is below the median at age 60, your risk of dying of prostate cancer is virtually zero. So there's a lot of people that think if you do a PSA level and your PSA is below the median, you may never need to do another PSA ever again in your life. That's a real proposal by some people. I think it's probably safer to do it once again, <laughs> just to be sure. So, um, so PSA above the median means you need to monitor. You don't, you don't need to biopsy half the population, but you need to monitor them. Okay, so he was tested a year later and he went from 1.5 to 2.4. Is that, is that a change? Is that rising? Is that bad? It's still normal. Well, the PSA is increased. Now, some people talk about a PSA velocity. If the PSA is changed by more than 0.85 in a year, and here it's 0.9, then that's a worry and you should repeat it very soon with an enhancement which is called the free to total PSA ratio. Now I'm not going to talk about this meet this um, lecture but um, it's an enhancement for patients who who have got a PSA that's worrying. Okay so uh, they didn't do that so they waited until it was abnormal and now we can say the PSA is elevated well now will you repeat it and confirm with PSA ratio. Now this, um, what is the level at which you should worry about prostate cancer or screen or biopsy? Now, if we had a study in Europe called the EISCP study, which said we choose a cutoff of three. And by using a cutoff of three, they reduce the mortality from prostate cancer by 21%. So in Australia, that's what we use as the cutoff, three. Not four, not age-related, just three. And that's covered in, if you want to look it up, we've got some national guidelines which say that if your PSA is above three, you need to repeat it, confirm it, and if it's abnormal, go off and have some imaging rather than necessarily a biopsy. So here, this patient was above three in 2003, let alone when he was above four. So really, well, what's the difference? If you've gone from one and a half to four, it's all pretty much the same. Well, it's not because when you've gone from less than 2.5 to above four, your risk of having a cancer that's spread out of the gland has doubled. It's still likely that it's in the gland, but the risk of it spreading outside the gland has already doubled. We don't want to wait until it's four or six or 10 before we diagnose it, because it's gonna be incurable if it's outside the gland. So this patient um, kept on monitoring their PSA and the PSA is rising like this. Now, how do we interpret that? It's rising slowly. Is that a worrying rise or not? Now, I like to use the doubling time. You can plug those values into a doubling time calculator, exponential doubling time calculator. And the one that I like is from Memorial Sloan Kettering in, in New York. If you double in those times, you get a doubling time. That patient's PSA is doubling every five years. What does that mean? Well, when the PSA is rising quickly, you'll die of prostate cancer. If it's not rising quickly, you don't. But in between, you can have prostate cancer, which won't kill you. Slowly rising PSA, which won't kill you. Now, what's the normal PSA doubling time? Well, in benign prostatic hyperplasia, the PSA usually doubles every 10 years or so. But in aggressive benign hypertrophy of the gland, um, the doubling time can be around five years. So for, for our elderly man, we don't know whether he's got aggressive BPH or whether he's got a mild prostate cancer. This is just some distribution of doubling times that we've got in our database. So you can see the average doubling time is around five years. The lower it is, so when you're below the average, you've got a risk of prostate cancer. When you're above the average, you've got no risk of... If your doubling time is above five years, you've either got no prostate cancer, you've got no risk of dying of prostate cancer. So here's this man um, eight or ten years later, and here's his PSA still rising gradually. And if we plug those values into the Memorial Sloan Kettering calculator, it says, still says the doubling time is five years. The doubling time is highly constant in an individual. It doesn't change. But 
but now with that we've waited to this means over 10 the cancer's almost odds on to be outside the gland and so now this is eight years after that here's the prostate the psa and it's rising exponentially now he's done pretty well 18 years down the track that very slow growing cancer has finally caught up with him. Now, should he have had a prostatectomy 18 years ago and had 18 years of impotence and incontinence? That's the questions that you have to, uh, you have to understand. And the information which is most important is understanding what the PSA is, whether there's a cancer there and how aggressive it is. Now, there's two issues we're talking about here. One is the tumour marker level tells you how much cancer there is and the rate of rise of the, of the tumour marker tells you how aggressive the cancer is. So when you've got a PSA that's changing from 0.02 to 0.04, it's doubled in a year. It's just as aggressive as a cancer that's gone from 200 to 400. It's doubled in a year. The only difference is this one's far more, you know, you've got a lot more of this tumour than this tumour, but they're both equally aggressive. Now, this leads to how do you monitor tumour markers? So when you'd monitor tumour markers, uh, most people think of them as the numbers. So here's this man, like our man. You know, the PSA was low and then it started to rise and then it took off. And people say, oh, there was a mutation and the cancer changed. It's not. You have to think of these numbers as a cancer would exponent. So first of all, we'll plot them according to time rather than just sample one, sample two. And we can see that the reason why there seemed to be a plateau was because we started worrying when the PSA was 600. We did a whole lot of tests close together. Now, tumours grow exponentially. One, becomes, one cell becomes two, two becomes four. And so when you plot out PSA levels, which mark the amount of cancer, you should plot them on an exponential axis, a logarithmic axis. And when we plot exactly the same numbers as I showed you before on an exponential graph, you can see that the tumour that this man had was changing exactly the same as when he went from 0.5 to 4 as when he went from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, or 100 to 1,000. You could have predicted how aggressive this cancer was if you had have looked at the doubling time at a very early stage. And so all tumour markers should be monitored on logarithmic paper or with a logarithmic concept like doubling time. Um, and this has been known for a long time. Here's another example of a man who had a cancer. He had it treated and then it came back. And guess what? The cancer that was there originally that came back is exactly the same aggression. The cells are the same, it's just we didn't get rid of them all, but they're still there just as aggressive as they were before. Okay, so we're gonna skip through some tumor markers now. So first of all, we'll talk about the gastrointestinal tumor markers. They, they're qualified by this family of mucins. So all of these tumour markers that are highlighted in red belong to the same family of glycoproteins. Um, and all of them have the same characteristics. They're, you know, looking for them in serum is a very poor sensitivity for local disease and very, but a high sensitivity of metastatic disease. They're not great tumour markers. Compared to PSA, they're, they're not very good. So here are the ones that we know about, but here are all of these other mucinous markers that have been discovered over the years and hadn't stood the test of time. Some of them are still around, but these are the ones we commonly use, still use. And they, you know, they're from this family of MUC1, MUC2 genes on different chromosomes, and they're expressed in different tissues. That's why they're selective for different tissues, both in health, benign disease and malignant disease. And they're, they're transmembranous proteins, and they've got this long extracellular um, domain, which can be sloughed off and end up in the circulation, which is what we measure in the serum. And that that side uh, chain has got you know lots of glycated residues on on the peptide um, linkage. So CEA, the father of all mucinous markers, is mainly in colon cancer, but not all colon cancer. It's also found in lung cancer. It's also found in breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. So it's hardly um, tissue specific and it's hardly tumor specific. 
Um, it was first discovered as a carcinoembryonic antigen. It's found, it was found in cancer and it was found in embryos. So here's uh, old octoloni type plate. So, you know, the, the same protein that reacts in cancer is the same protein that you can find in the, feet, the healthy fetus in the gut. It's just sloughed off from the fetal cells. And you know the, and you can find CEA in the feces of healthy people. It's a normal protein. It's just that it usually ends up in feces and doesn't end up. It shouldn't end up in blood. If it ends up in blood, it's a sign that you know a colon cancer is invading the body, and the stuff that should go into feces is going into your blood. Um, and again, like PSA in the early stages, they thought, oh, it's only elevated in colorectal cancer. But then gradually, and, and you know, it rises in proportion to the cancer. So like I said, in localised cancers, it's often normal, but in advanced cancer, it's usually elevated. Um, now, here's the architect kit insert, and they say less than five is the reference interval. Um, that cutoff is a little bit less specific for non-smokers. In the Cobas kit insert, the Electus Cobas insert, it says that, um, well, it seems to rise a bit with age and it's higher with smokers. Hmm. Now, this is a study that I really like. It looked at a whole lot of um, uh, studies of the tumor markers and found what are the things that change CEA? And they found two things that change CEA in healthy volunteers, uh, age and smoking with a p-value less than 0.001. Now, we did we looked at our data and it looks like PSA, uh, CEA rises with age in men and in women, darker red and darker blue. And so that's our, and we actually use these as reference intervals for CEA in our laboratory because we know that it rises with age. And if you don't allow it to rise with age, you'll lose specificity in the elderly and there'll be a whole lot of elderly patients who are flagging when they're above five and the only thing they've got is being old. So here's one of these 73-year-old women and so she's she's got a pelvic mass and she's a smoker. We've used the cutoff of 10, which is a normal CEA for her age. If she was younger, a CEA of 10 would not be normal. Now, a whole lot of tumour markers rise with age. I've already said PSA and CAA, but SAD 19.9 and 15.3 is also said. Alpha feta protein will return to. Does this change with age? Okay, CEA. What about the difference between the methods? Here's um, Abbott, Roche. This is for a particular sample. And they're different. And so you have to be careful with switching methods. Samples can be very different between methods. Now, why should they be different? Well, not, people, not many people know, but there are two types of CEA. There's um, CEA and another one, which is non-specific crotchetic antigen 2. And the assays differ whether they pick up the two types of CEA. And so Abbott and Roche tend to pick up both, but you know, do they calibrate the same way? Do they calibrate to both antigens? And so that's what leads to the variation, even with CEA assays. Okay, case three, a 27-year-old man, unlucky, he's got a colon cancer. And we're measuring the old CEA, which was the Abbott CEA in our lab, and we moved to the Roche CEA. And you can see that they change in unison. So it looks like they're really measuring the same thing, but they've got a different calibration. Both of them are saying the same thing. So the interpretation with the CL levels are consistent and showing an improvement. And we could have actually shown that improvement in his liver function test because his, um, his biliary obstruction was improving as well. Biliary enzymes show consistent improvement and agree with CEA assessment. Okay, now breast. Um, breast has CA15-3 as a marker as well as CEA. Um, now, CA15-3 is a cutoff of 31.3. The methods are different. The methods can be different. Now, this is a CA15-3 level of two or 300, so the assays can be very different in patients with a particular malignancy or type of malignancy. So um, be careful. This means you do not switch monitoring patient from one lab to another because you might think they're improving and all you've done is change, change methods. 
What about 15.3? You know, what's the reference interval? Is it, well, was it a 95% specific interval or a 99% specific interval? Roche lets you decide what you want to use. Um, the expected values in disease. Gynecological diseases can cause an elevation and pregnancy can cause a mild elevation of CR15.3, according to the kit insert. And what about disease? What other, other than breast, what other cancers can produce CA 15.3? Well, any type of cancer. <laughs> like, it's not a specific for breast cancer. Um, and does it rise in breast cancer? Does it rise with the stage? Yes, it rise, it's more likely to be elevated the higher the stage. Does CA 15.3 change with age? Well, when we looked at it in 2008, it seemed to rise with age. Um, but recently I looked at it with Roche and um, it does seem to rise after about the age of 50 gr very gradually for men and women, but there doesn't seem to be any difference in men and women, which is interesting for a marker that's supposed to be a breast marker. It's not. <laughs> okay, it's case four. Here's a, a lady with CA of the breast. And here's these astronomical levels of CA 15.3, but fortunately she's responding to chemotherapy and they're all changing. Now, look, the, this oncologist has asked for CEA, CA125 and CA 15.3. And you can see that, you know, they're changing much the same, but there are subtle differences in the way they change. Some of them may be measuring proliferation and some of them might be measuring invasion. So the oncologists ought like to have some confirmation that the tumour marker is truly a marker of tumour burden rather than a marker of something else like necrosis or invasion. So it's very common in, in at least in Australia, to use multiple tumour markers to track a tumour. So here's um, another patient with breast cancer. You can see their CA15.3 is almost nothing, whereas the CA is the much stronger marker. Well, how would you know that unless you measured them all? Um, and this patient here, their, um, you know, their liver function tests aren't changing very much. Okay, here's another case, a 63-year-old with cancer of the right breast. Um, and here's the CA15.3 elevated, the CA and the CA125 are not elevated. Uh, now, she was treated and the CA the markers decreased, which was really reassuring for the oncologist. This was in 2010. She had her breast cancer treated and everything returned to normal. Now in 2018, eight years later, her liver function started going off and, it, and ultrasound showed a liver mass. And they were saying, uh oh, the breast cancer's come back. So they did the tumor markers. And you can see the 15.3 wasn't elevated. None of them were elevated. But what was elevated was the alpha feta protein. So this was a very unlucky woman who, that's secondary, which we might have assumed to be a breast cancer re, a, a recurrence, was actually a new hepatoma. Alpha feta protein is a marker of hepatoma. Uh, fortunately, that was treated um, uh, effectively. And, um, but, you know, a couple of years later, it started to come back. And her um, liver function started to go off again. And, um, you know, but she's, she's been very unlucky, but she's responded twice to chemotherapy. So she's um, done reasonably well. Alpha feta protein, reference interval 13.4. Um, the reference intervals in health, less than seven well here for the abbott it says 13.4 with 99 percent specificity whereas with roche it says less than seven with 95 percent specificity so do you want 95 or 99 percent specificity for alpha feta protein so that's something you need to decide with your clinicians um, and then the yeah, alpha feta protein rises with the stage of hepatocellular cancer, and it's usually not elevated in any other malignancies. That's why we're pretty confident with that other woman when she had a raised alpha feta protein. It wasn't a breast cancer. It was a liver cancer. 
Now, does alpha-fetoprotein rise with age? Well, the study that I told you there said high significance change with age. And when we look at our data, one of the things with alpha-fetoprotein is very high in neonates because it's the fetal albumin. Alpha-fetoprotein is what fetuses use for albumin. So it takes a year or so for it to return to normal levels in children. And then in adults, it does it rise? Um, in boys, it falls the same as girls. And does it rise or does it rise and fall? I had a closer look at this with interquartile ranges. And you can see that alpha-fetoprotein rises and then falls. So that's why people couldn't work out whether alpha-fetoprotein rises or falls with age, because it rises and falls with age. And unless you understand that, you're going to be putting out reference intervals which are not as specific as you think they are. Alpha feta protein, fortunately, is something that most laboratories report, most methods are very similar for. Um, I'm still not sure whether I'd monitor it between laboratories. Okay, so here's a man, 17 year old man with swelling of his testicles. He's got a rails alpha feta protein. Is that hepatoma? No, it's a different tumor. It's a testicular tumor because it's producing HCG. And these are the germline tumors. So he had it managed well. The alpha feta protein took a bit longer to come down than the HCG. I think alpha feta protein's got a longer half life. Um, and uh, so that was good. So, so what does that mean? If we've got alpha feta protein and HCG, can it tell, help to make us a diagnosis? Well, it can, because we know in testicular tumours, seminomas have HCG, but embryonal, embryonal tumours are the ones that have alpha feta protein and HCG. So the pattern of tumour markers is also helpful. Here's a man with a non-small cell cancer of the lung. HCG and CA125, no CEA, no alpha beta protein. So HCG can, can, it's not only produced by germline tumors, it can rarely be produced by other tumors, including lung cancers. So, you know, when you say to an oncologist, no, you're not allowed to have a HCG because it's a lung cancer you're dealing with. No, it's very important to be able to do every tumor marker that might be elevated because that's what you get. he's going to need to monitor. Now, HCG, differences between methods, definitely. So here's Roche is higher than Abbott and Siemens. Roche is higher than Beckman. But Vitros is even higher than Roche. What the hell is all that about? And that's because of this form of HCG called hyperglycosylated HCG. It's a form of HCG which is produced in the early implantation of the cytotrophoblast, and it's also produced in the immature cells of a tumour. And so you really need to use, ideally you need to use a hyperglycosylated assay to pick up the, all forms of HCG. And the Roche assay and the Vitros assay can pick them up and the others cannot. And they're not actually accredited as tumor markers. It can be used for pregnancy, but it's very dangerous to use them for tumor markers because you'll miss a lot of um, particularly early um, cancers. Okay, uh, uh, reproductive um, cancers, this mainly, I'm not going to talk about, I haven't got time to talk about Roma and Casa and everything. So CA125, it's a very interesting thing. CA125 is is produced whenever the body wants to make a cavity. So even in the embryo, when it makes these two cavities, the blastocyst and the coelom, it, it produce, it puts CA125 in them. Don't ask me why. <laughs> um, and that and that cavity leads to the other cavities of the body, like the peritoneal cavity, the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity, and the coverings of the ovary, the cavities that have to allow the egg to get to the um, fallopian tubes, if you like. So, um, so all of these tissues, because they're silomic derived, produce CA125. And the amnion itself, Amniotic fluid is a rich source of CA125. But CA125 is not just elevated in tumours of the ovary. It can be elevated in any cancer. And basically, any cancer that involves a cavity can raise CA125. And so when you've got a fluid collection, a pleural fluid collection, the, um, the CA125 level will be high 
in benign pleural fluid. Whereas with other tumour markers, they're usually normal in pleural, pleural fluid. CA99 is not high in pleural fluid. CAEA is not high in pleural fluid. And you can work out that it's a normal fluid. And in this study here, when they're looking at the level of tumour marker in a fluid, a malignant fluid versus a benign fluid, there's no difference between benign and malignant fluids for CA125 in serum, and there's very little difference in ascites. So, you know, CA125 is a characteristic of fluid. It's not a characteristic of tumours. It's higher in tumours, but it's not, it's elevated in both types. And just to give you more insight, when you look at the ovarian vein in people with cancers and the peripheral vein, CA125, there's a perfect correlation. The concentration of CA125 in the ovarian vein is the same as it is in the cubital vein. Whereas when you look at the CA125 level in the peritoneal fluid, it's higher than in the vein. So the source of CA125 is the fluid, not the tumour. So raised CA125, what can it be due to? Well, very rarely due to CA ovaries. More commonly, other cancers that involve cavities and even fluids which have got nothing to do with cancers like Congestive cardiac failure, congestive, i.e. fluids. And in this um, paper, that you know, CA125 is actually a very good marker of cardiac failure. It's higher in the blood of patients who've got pleural fluid. Um, just quickly with CA125, what's the reference interval? When it was first discovered in 1984, they actually tested a whole lot of nuns, believe it or not. And 99% of the nuns were below 35, and that was the reference interval. 99% specificity, the cutoff is 35. And so in the Axum kit insert, which is based on that method, 99% 99 specificity for a cutoff of 35. But very soon after, they developed a new assay with two antibodies, two monoclonal antibodies, which increased the sensitivity of the assay and the performance. And they found that the new assay measured 25% higher than the older assay. And so now we knew that. And when we did the studies moving from Axum to Architect, we found that the slope was 1.25. The new assay is 25% higher. And when the architect came out, which was a CA125-2 assay, the slope was 1.23, close enough to 1.25. And so what did the kit insert say? The kit insert said the cutoff is still 35, but it has a lower specificity. So they've tricked us into thinking the assay hasn't changed. What was What's happening is you're losing specificity Rather than 1% false positives, we've now got 5% false positives if we use a cutoff of 35 for the new CA125 methods. And so people said, you should use cutoffs of 45 for the architect and 35, 34 for the axon. For CA125 assays, whether they're from Siemens or from Roche, the cutoff should be closer to 45 than 35. And in this paper, they also showed that the the CA125 changes with age. It seems to be lower in the postmenopausal women. And we found the same thing. CA125 is higher and it drops at menopause and then it rises slightly with age. And so here's the median CA125 with the Roche assay, um, quarter of a million data points here. So uh, it's higher in premenopausal women than men. Then it's much the same at postmenopause, and then it rises in both with age. CR125 is excreted by the kidney. That's why it rises with age. So when people say, you know, well, which one? In this paper, they said, well, CR125 falls with age. Yes, it falls with age in, in postmenopausal women, but if you keep following it in older women, it rises again. Very important to understand. So here is now here's the problem. When you can introduce all that confusion, 95% specificity, 99% CA125 calibrated to the, the original assay or the new assay, the, assay, the results can be very different between platforms. And the Alexis, you know, like the architect says, the cutoff is 35, but you've got 5% false positive rate. Lastly, CA199. 
Uh, the cutoff is 37 with 95% specificity. This is a marker for um, for many types of cancers, particularly um, pancreas and biliary cancers. So here's a case eight. Here's a patient who's got worsening um, liver function test and a recent onset of upper abdominal pain. It's a intrahepatic cholestasis picture because the cholestatic enzymes are high, but there's no jaundice. So is there is there something appearing? Is there a tumor in the liver? So we we could do some tumor markers. Well, here are the tumor markers. CN 199 is 37,000. That's not going to be a benign disease. So this is probably pancreatic cancer, possibly in Australia, possibly stomach cancer. I know it differs around the world. And so now that's the same patient. So managed, they managed to give them some therapy and then it started falling and rising again. And you can see that the CEA is reflecting the same thing, but the numbers are not nearly as convincing as the CA199. That's why the oncologist wants both. And so as it's getting worse, you know, the, the liver mets weren't growing very quickly and then sort of got out of hand and the liver mets, you know, started changing very rapidly. So well, she did fairly well. She went five years with a, a pretty aggressive um, pancreatic cancer. Okay, second last case, a uh, man with stomach cancer, and you can see here the CR99 is a pretty good mark of a stomach cancer um, as well. Uh, here's a man with stomach cancer on immun... Oh, that's the same man who's very unlucky, age 27 with stomach cancer, and, um, and he's getting some response to immunotherapy, and they're happy to monitor just with CR99. Here's a woman with pancreatic cancer, and there's no CA99. And so they have to use CA, CEA to monitor the pancreatic cancer. Why is there no CA99? The reference interval for uh, is nine, uh, less than 34. The sensitivity is about two uh, of the assay. Um, CA99 is elevated in other diseases, not just pancreatic bilages, it can be elevated in liver disease, lung disease, gynecological disease. So it's it's as specific as the other mucinous markers. Um, and it's uh, and these are the liver diseases. Any liver disease can elevate it and just about any pulmonary disease and so on. So it's not a specific test. Now, the thing about CR99 is it's the same glycoprotein target as the Lewis blood group antigen. And just as you can be group A or group RH positive, you can also be Lewis positive or Lewis negative. And if you're Lewis negative, you can't make CA199. So there's some patients like that patient I just showed you who can't make 199. And so when you look at the reference interval for CA199 in men and women, there's a whole lot of people like 10 or 15% who have unmeasurable C, uh, CA199. And it depends on their Lewis blood group whether they can make the Lewis blood group and whether they can secrete it into the serum. And so the reference interval, in some countries, they do your Lewis blood group to work out what your reference interval for CA99 should be. So does CA99 change with age? Here they said it does. It's not obvious there that it does. But anyway, I did look at our own data, 100,000 data points, and it it's much the same between men and women. I don't quite understand why it's slightly higher in younger women than young men, but it does rise gradually with age. And there are differences between the methods. Be careful. So in summary, there's no ideal tumour marker. Um, screening will always produce false positives than true positives. Case finding is the way to decrease false positives by increasing prevalence. Um, specificity is improved by understanding the age and gender effects in your reference intervals. While tumour markers may be selective for tumours of some tissues, they may produce by many types of malignancy. An oncologist should be supported in choosing the optimal marker for each patient. So you should be able to use a few different markers to see which one is the best for the patient. And method differences should be assumed to exist. So Caution when you 
reporting and choosing a reference interval and caution when you're monitoring a patient across methods. Sorry, I've used up um, all of the time, but I do. I, I'm happy to hang around for questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for for that wonderful presentation. And think, you know, you really covered uh, a lot of the major tumor markers that we use today. Yeah. Uh, and so, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself using that that microphone uh, button, or to type it in the chat. Uh, and then to start us off, oh, I see a raised hand. Uh, K Shanti Naidu. Yeah. yeah, I'm Dr. Shanti from Hyderabad, India. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So my question to you is, how do you uh, use these tumor markers in the various fluids they ask? Because there's no major studies which give us these fluids, but there are a lot, especially for pseudocyst and pseudopancreatic cancer, all this, we have a lot of requests for fluids. How do you work on that? Yes, I didn't cover that. I sort of showed that the fluid can so with CA125, the concentration in the fluid can be the same as in the serum. Well, well clearly the, the source of the cancer is not in that fluid. So, but otherwise, we insist on always having serum with the fluid. You must have the serum. You can't interpret a fluid on its own. The level of the tumour marker in the fluid could be 10, it could be 1,000, could be 100,000. What, do what does it mean? So, because the level in the blood is, you know, you have to compare. And generally, we say that the level in the fluid has to be significantly higher than the level in the serum to say that that fluid is bathing the tumour. That fluid is close to the source of the tumour. So let's say you've got pleural fluid and the CEA level is the same as the blood level of CEA. Well, clearly, that's not where the CEA is coming from. Whereas if the CEA in the pleural fluid is two to three times higher than the serum, well, that must be the source of where the CA is coming from. That's the rich source of the CA. So it's the CA is coming from the pleural fluid or, or the, whatever's, wherever that tumour is, it's shedding into the pleural fluid and uh, the pleural fluid is what usually is draining into the blood. So in other words, sir, if the serum, if the fluid levels are much lower than the serum, can we say that the fluid is negative? Can we yes. use the term? Yeah, remember, it, we, we also, when you're looking at fluid for LD and protein and glucose, we often say that the fluid level of protein is, is something like two thirds of the serum level. So typically, if it's the, if the protein's coming into the fluid from the fluid, from the serum or from it, extracellular fluid, the level will be slightly lower in the fluid by about two thirds. So if you see the serum, yeah, I agree with you. If the fluid level is less than, ideally less than two thirds of the serum level, it's got nothing to do with the tumor. It's just okay. coming from the serum. Okay. And my other question to you, if I may ask is, is there any reference for cutoffs of uh, these tumor markers in fluids, sir? Is there any? There are papers, but a bit like um, the problem with serum, you, there might be a paper that says, you know, we think that if the fluid is above a thousand, there's lots of some with thyroglobulin, for example, you know, uh, thyroid cyst fluid, and we measure the thyroglobulin. If it's above a certain level, it's consistent with the tumor. Well, which assay? because the assays vary. And so you need to be, whilst you can find those papers, you need to be very careful in making sure that your assay measures the same way as that assay. And I think that the variation in fluids is gonna be even larger than the variation in serum between assays. Many of the immunoassay platforms don't actually clearly give a statement that you can use it in fluids. But no. if we do use it as an, of the of the label mark, is it acceptable? Um, in Australia, we have to validate our, when we use it for a yeah. fluid. So what we do, uh, in general terms, what we do is we do serial dilutions of any fluid with serum, and show that the serial dilution of fluid and serum is linear. 
If it's non-linear, then there's non-commutability. Okay. And so we do that over and over again. And when we've proven it 20 or 30 times, then we say that we've validated the fluid for that particular fluid. But we might need to do it 20 or 30 times for plural fluid and 20 or 30 times for acidic fluid. Okay. So it's a long process to do that. But we, but if it's useful, it's worthwhile. And so most laboratories in Australia are, are you know, either have or in the process of validating fluids. Um, against serum um, so that they can prove to the laboratory assessors that the, the a fluid is behaving the same way as serum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for that question. I think very interesting discussion. Uh, so I have a question as well, um, which is about uh, cutoffs and reference intervals. I see, you know, you mentioned 95, 95th percentile, 97.5 percentile, 99th percentile. Um, you know, what would you recommend using or what, what do you personally use at your institution? Look, it sort of depends on the impact of the false positive. So the reason why uh, CA125 was pushed was well ideally should be a 99% cutoff is because the impact of a false positive for query ovarian cancer is terrible like it's like a whole lot of imaging and potential biopsies or even laparotomy in the old days before we had imaging and and by you know people used to go to laparotomy on the basis of a ray ca 125 well you do not want false positives and so you go for 99% specificity, whereas if you've got a simple confirmatory test, let's say for PSA, there's a simple confirmatory test now. I mean, you could repeat it with free to total PSA, but nowadays in most of, of the West, we've got uh, MRI, multi-resonance uh, uh, imaging. So, um, and that's available for like four, three or $400 in Australia. So most people would be happy to go for an MRI uh, and have a you know a positive predictive value that's you know only 20 or 30 percent because of the poor cutoff because the impact of the false positive is less. So so I think you need to think about that that impact of the false false positive. If the impact of the false positive is too expensive or too harmful. You should be using a 99% cutoff. That's how you can adjust the false positive, uh, the positive predictive value. That's the best I can say. Um, I don't think you can answer it, um, you know, in general terms. It, it, it depends on each tumour marker and what what a positive result would mean for a screening test. I see. Thank you.